we, we, but we focused really on Java concepts and, and OO design and, and that sort of thing. And really the programs that we've been working on, we've developed some classes, but really we haven't developed anything like a full-fledged application because just about every application would require some sort of user interface. I suppose there are some applications that could run as time processes or like, uh, like they say in Unix, a cron process that is set up and, and defined to run a certain time and all that. But most every application has some sort of, of user interface that uh, the user interacts with uh, to put that in, you know. Um, so, you know, how do you know uh, if the student is taking a, a lecture class or a lab class and, and how do you know uh, whether they're in county or out of county or whatever. You know that through, uh, you know, supplying it with a user interface. So, um, the other thing, the other component that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about later on, not later on today, but in, uh, in, in the next couple of weeks, is about persistence. In other words, the other thing that an application needs to do is be able to save something, all right? Um, so, well, we're moving in that uh, direction. Anyhow, today we're talking about GUI. Um, the components to create GUIs in Java are called swing components. Swim, swing components evolved from an earlier set of components which were called AWT components. And someone pressed the button. Ashley, I think it was you. All right. So they, uh, they they came out of and they they evolved from AWT and some of the some of the concepts still are in uh, uh, AWT sort of based objects but but the widgets the controls are our swing components. I was just reading a little bit about them to refresh my memory before class. Apparently, swing are uh, truly platform into, uh, independent things. They're they're written all in Java, and and so on. All right. Um, You know what? Stop the presses. We still have some things with exceptions to clear up, don't we? Where did we leave off last time? Did I throw any exceptions? I'm, get, I'm confusing myself here a, a little bit, which isn't uncommon. We showed, we showed the thing about passing a driver's test and throwing, uh, 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 throwing exceptions, right? Okay, I guess I guess we did cover that, uh, unless you have questions, of course, on that. I, th I think we covered that. Okay, I guess we are on the GUIs now. My my mistake. I, I I do apologize for that that thing. I just glanced down and I saw that in my notes, and and uh, I'm not sure why it's there. I think that's just a carryover from last week. All right. Okay, back on to swing events or, or swing um, swing components um, we are going to uh, we're, we're going to just introduce them today we're not going to spend a lot of time focusing on the layout the, uh, and, and achieving the layout um, in these we're just going to focus on sort of the main concepts um, the main concepts are, are something like this and there really is these swing components if you look they have a whole inheritance structure to them all right. Um, we are gonna we're gonna focus on the main uh, components, and the main components work something like this. You have a frame. All right. That corresponds to a window. Inside this frame, you have a content panel. You then, inside that content panel, have all these different components. So any kind of things that you would think of as typically being in a, a user interface. Um, text boxes, radio buttons, check boxes, drop downs, and so on. And finally, buttons. All right. Now, 
we have code that reacts when the user interacts certain ways with these components. All right. Specifically, the most straightforward example of that is we're, we're going to have, we're going to write some code that fires off when the user clicks a button. All right. And this code is in the form of uh, what is called an action listener. The notion of an action listener is like this. You have a piece of code that is waiting for a certain event to occur. All right? And when that event occur occurs, then that piece of code fires off. So, you know, action listener, the action is it causes something to happen or or the action listener is is waiting for a certain action, all right? is listening for it, is waiting for it, and when it happens again, it, it takes action of its own. All right? Uh, and it handles event. In, in uh, VB terminology, I guess you'd call this like an event handler or, or in other programming languages. All right? These action listeners are classes and they implement the action listener interface. Okay, so there's an action listener interface. But as we all know, what an interface means is that um, it's a contract that the class is going to implement certain methods. So let's look up the action listener interface and let's see what methods we could expect to find. There actually is only one. And the method that it contains, again, it has its whole, whole own uh, inheritance structure, but the method that you must implement if you're going to implement one of these is the action performed method. All right? And um, it gets past this argument of E. And that argument E is information about the event that just occurred. All right, so you can interrogate that and get certain properties about just exactly what happened. There's some fields, there's some methods, and so on. For example, it indicates if the alt key was held on during the event, and so on. All right, so let's look at an example of this. And what we're going to see is we're going to see an example with a, a, a frame and a control panel within that frame and some elements within that control panel and an action listener that actually does something when we click the button. So first I want to do is show you how it behaves and I'll, then we'll, we'll look at, uh, we'll examine the code. All right. Yeah. All right. Here's a window that consists of a text box and a button. And this is my famous, almost as famous as a Hello World uh, application, uh, converting temperatures from centigrade to Fahrenheit. So we go and we type in its temperature in centigrade. Zero degrees centigrade, it should convert to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And sure enough, it does. So, what we have on this, we have actually our frame, our panel. We have one label, a text box, a button, and then another label. And this button, it, you know, has associated with it a action event listener that is waiting for it to be clicked 
and for it to do its thing. All right, so let's look at the code here. I have to say those of you do, that are used to maybe doing uh, UIs through a, a GUI, you know, uh, this may seem a little awkward at first, but really what your GUI is doing, you know, when you create in .NET or whatever, you know, uh, some, sort of, uh, some sort of GUI by dragging and dropping controls around, this is what it's doing. All right, it's just kind of shielding, shielding you from that. And we'll see even uh, um, if we do uh, later assignments, if, if we use uh, an IDE, you'll see that you can do the same thing here. Here we're writing it from, from scratch because we really want to understand what's going on on that level. So let's look at, oops, wrong folder. Let's look at the code. All right. By the way, again, if, if you ever open these up and they don't look right, they look goofy like that, just open up in WordPad and save them, and then open them back up in Notepad. All right. See at the top, because these are typically, a lot of these examples I've done on the Mac, which has a different and aligned character, apparently. All right. So, there's only one class in this example. So, in this particular case, um, this class is everything. All right, and we'll, we'll see how it can be everything, all right, uh, in a second here. But we are importing the stuff necessary. We're importing the swing components, and we're importing from the AWT library the action listener and action event. All right. My class is called first GUI, and notice that it, it you know, it extends JFrame, so it's going to be a window, and it implements action listener. Now, what does implement action listener mean? It means that it needs to have the event, I'm sorry, it needs to have the method of action performed on it. All right? So really, this is a window, and essentially, you could think of it as a window, and it also contains the code that processes the click event. All right? We won't always have this. All right? We will sometimes have other classes have the code to handle the event. But in this first example, probably the easiest thing to do is just put everything all in, all in one. And then we can look at how we can go and make separate classes for that, uh, for, for that event handling. All right. This has four attributes corresponding to the attributes that I talk through in the window. A label a text field, a button, and then a label for the results. Notice the one label says, has a label of enter temperature in centigrade. The text box has no value. We've specified four spaces for it, four characters for it. Uh, the button, the title of the button or the, or the text of the button is convert. And then our results label initially is a... Uh, um, you know, is, is an empty string. All right, so that corresponds to the components that we get when we first fire this off. Label, text box, button, other label with currently nothing in it. All right. Now this is, here's a bit of code that's a little tricky. All right. Because this is the um, is is everything's in one class in this example because of this? This has to be the class that has the main two in it, right? So this has the main method in it, all right. And this code might look a little odd, except when you think of the code uh, or, or the concepts that we talked about last time of a static method versus a a, a regular method that's instance based. In other words, what's the line of code in here say? All right. When we run main for this, so if I type in Java first GUI, it's going to do the main method in that. And what does the main method do? It create a, creates an instance of itself. All right. Which kind of seems a little bit odd, except when you realize that because this is a static method, all right, it doesn't require an instance to run this method. All right? So you might say, how can, an, how can a, a class make 
an object of itself? How can it make an instance of itself? Well, a static method can make an instance of itself. All right. Uh, you know, you might say, well, gee, how, how would that one get created? Well, it's static, so it doesn't require an instance. All right. So, when I run this code, when I type in Java first GUI, this runs, which creates an instance of that, uh, of itself. All right. And, of course, what's the first thing that fires off when you create an instance of something? The constructor fires off. All right. And here's our constructor. All right. Yes. Right. In other words, what you're saying is we, since we didn't, okay, we run that and that calls that first GUI and first GUI will create it. Well, that's an excellent question, but it must consider there to be a reference to it. The fact that I, I'm invoking it and I'm calling that constructor and I'm doing things to that. For example, I'm setting the visibility of it and all that. Because I'm doing things to it in that constructor, that must be enough to keep it around. You're right, there's no variable that, that, that this gets assigned to. But, um, this code must be enough to keep it around. I guess is probably the best way to put it. There are references to these. The other way to look at it is there are references to these things and these things live on that window and that also may be enough to keep it around. All right. Um, that's a great question. I guess I can't give you a definitive answer to that. But it does work, otherwise we wouldn't have anything to talk about for the next half hour. <laughs> All right, so yeah, it, it, it does keep it around, uh, even though there isn't a explicit reference to it. The 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 you know it, it is on uh, these methods that it calls in the constructor, and it are keeping it are opening the window, and the fact that the window is open, I suppose, is enough to keep an instance of it in existence. Good question, though. All right, so let's review the event so far. We compile this. When we run it, what happens? Of course, we call the main method. What does the main method do? Well, it creates an instance of itself. Creating the instance of it, what does that do? That's going to run the constructor, which is going to do these things. So what things are, uh, uh, are it... Uh, uh, what things are it, is it going to do? All right. First thing it's going to do is it sets some parameters about what happens when they close this window. All right. It exits. All right. So that's one thing that we've done. We've said this set default close operation. When you close this window, when you close the frame, I'm exiting on the close of that frame. I'm creating a J panel. Remember, we said we have our frame. And we have a panel that sits on the frame, and then we put the stuff on the panel, and then we are ready to go. I say btn convert add lit action listener this. This, I would imagine, is a very confusing line. Does anyone want to take a stab at what you think this does? What does this line of code do? If explain it in in regular words. Yes. Puts the action on the button. Okay. It puts the action listener on the button. And what does it what becomes then the action listener for that button? This does. All right. And what is this? This is that frame itself that it's creating and popping up. 
So remember, in this particular example, this one class, this one object is going to contain everything. All right? So what I say is, all right, that button, I'm going to assign it an action listener. All right? What is that action listener? It's going to be this. All right? What is this? This always means the object that you're currently in, and therefore the object that this constructor is creating becomes the action listener. In other words, that frame becomes the action listener for the button. That frame contains the code, all right, that handles the event when that button gets clicked. Now, we can do that because when we created this frame, we said it implements action listener, all right? And because it implements action listener, what does that mean? That means that it has to contain this action performed method down here. Which, what do you suppose that contains? It contains the code that I want to run when that button gets clicked. All right. So what hooks everything together? I've, I'm implementing the action listener interface. That means I have to define this action performed. Because I've implemented that, I can assign to the button this object as the action listener for that button. Yes? So if you had another class with the code, you just replace this with the other With the other class, exactly. And we'll see, uh, and again, uh, if we did that, the question was, is what if we had another class that handled it as opposed to this? Um, then yeah, you'd put the name of the class. We'll actually see a couple alternatives on how you do that in the next example. I don't know if we'll get to that one today or, or uh, on Wednesday. All right. But um, again, we're assigning it the action listener, which is this object itself. All right. And that's okay because, again, this is polymorphic, right? This is accepting any sort of object that implements the action listener. So we could put anything in there as long as it supported the um, action listener uh, interface. In this case, it happens to be this very object itself, this very class itself. And therefore, we have that action perform method that contains the code that we want to do. All right. Then what do we do? Remember... The drawing over here, we have a frame. That frame has a panel, and that panel contains these things. So what we're going to do is we are going to add those four elements to this new panel that I've created. So I've created a panel, all right. I've added these four elements to it, the label, text box, button, and results. And the order matters, by the way, right? Because it's going to add them linearly. It's going to put the label for temperature in the first position, the text box, the button, and then the results. If I were to do this in another order, those controls would appear in another order. All right? Then I'm going, after I've done that, here's where I've made my panel. That panel is sort of floating out in space there. <laughs> All right, it's not really attached to anything. I add these controls to that panel. Then I add the panel to the frame. So if you want to think about it, these four statements, we're going to draw a diagram. I have my frame. I make a panel and put in my label, my text box, my button, and my other label. Alright, that's what, that's what these four statements do. Put on that panel these four controls. What the next statement does is it takes that panel and puts it on the frame. So, so now my frame, my window, contains that panel, and that panel contains my four controls. All 
I then set the size of it and I made it 800 wide and 100 tall and set visible to true makes it appear. All right. Again, this act must give the Java Virtual Machine enough of a reference to it to, to keep this thing alive and going. So, in other words, at this point, when the constructor is, if I, if I run this, that's going to create an instance of, your, of itself, it's going to run the constructor, and that's the end result. Here's our frame, our panel within the frame, which contains the four controls sitting there waiting there. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm calling a method. All right. Is it a method of this? Yeah, it is. It's actually a method of one of this guy's ancestors. It's a method of J frame or one of J frame's ancestors. All right. And I probably should have said this dot get, because that makes it explicit, right? If you don't say this, it's assumed to be this, and but again, that can cause some confusion. Yes. Yes. This is the frame itself. So again, this means that when I click on the exit, when I when I exit this window, I'm shutting this program down. All right. Exit. I'm close. Here I've created my panel that I'm going to put my controls on. Here, and we'll, we'll do that, then we'll come back and, and catch up on the action listener. I put my four controls on the panel. I put the panel on the frame. I set the size of the frame, and I make the frame visible. Somewhere in the middle there, all right, I go and I tell the button that this object, the very object that's being created, is its action listener. Which I can do because this very object implements the action listener interface. So that's okay. I can do that. And by implementing it, it promises that it's going to have a action perform method. Okay. So now we're up to this point where this is appearing. Let's go and figure out what happens then when we actually put something in and go and execute it. What does that do? Well, that causes the action perform method on the action listener to run. And what does that do? Well, I declare a variable for C. I declare a variable for F. I do a try this block. Why do I have a try here? Why is this wrapped up in a try block? Yeah. yeah. Who knows what a user is going to type in that, right? Temperature, it was pretty hot today. You know, who knows, right? So, therefore, we want to, if we do these things, we want to catch if there's any errors. Now, um, I could, I could go in and have a series of if statements, and if one of those was true, then I could do that, but we studied exceptions, we might as well practice them, right? So, I go in and I set the centigrade temperature to parse double, which takes and tries to convert this guy into a double. What is this guy? That text box the text that it contains. Right? So that's the name of the control, txt temp. And the get text method pulls what the user has put into the text box. I do my math. All right. I then set the results label. I do a set text on that results label. I've defined up here. To whatever that converted temperature is in Fahrenheit. Followed by the words degrees Fahrenheit. I'm catching any exception that happens here, and I'm simply putting in the results invalid input. It's probably a pretty safe bet, right? Because that's like the only thing that could go wrong. 
right? We're not dividing by zero or anything. We're not a interacting with the database. We're not interacting with any other classes. So really the only thing that could go wrong is if the, if, if the user puts some value of C in that messes up this parse to double. All right. So if you put in Mike and you try to parse that to a double, boom, that's going to fly off with an exception and that exception code will run. To demonstrate, again, if we put in something valid, if we put some garbage in, we get our exception code. That's a good question. Invalid input. Tries to take that text box, which is an empty string, make it into a double. Looks says, I don't know how to take an empty string and make it into a double. So it gives me invalid input. Throws some kind of exception. Yes? You keep putting values in there. The way this is written, yeah, it'll just do that as long as I want. Because every time I fire, every time I hit that button, that's going to fire off that action performed method. It's going to fire off that action performed method on the action listener. Again, in this case, everything's all wrapped up in that one object. So it's going to run that, and it's going to go and run, and it's going to grab the value of the text box at that point and do the calculation and set the label. And notice, again, we can even watch. Notice how this is sort of just hanging there because I ran it. That program's running. If I go and click the exit or, or the close button or the close box, whatever you call that, when I close that, that'll cause the, the, the app to exit. And there I have my C prompt again. Because I said exit on close. What do you suppose, what did we talk about last week that the highlighted thing is? J frame exit on close. If you had to guess what that was, what would it be? It'd be well, not a static method. Pardon me? Yeah, it'd be a static final. It would be an attribute. I know it's not a method because there's no parenthesis after it. So it's not calling a method. So this is an attribute. All right. It's static because in front of it is not the name of an object, but the name of a class. So JFrame is the name of a class. So I know it's static. I don't require an instance of the class to do that. And I know it's not a method because I don't see the two parentheses around it. And therefore, it's an attribute. Now. People smart enough to write the code of Java aren't going to put a, a, an attribute there unless the user couldn't mess it up. Right? So I know that that's some kind of final. So that's effectively a constant. All right? So that would be yeah, a static final on that class. Now we don't get to see that class right? because that code's in the framework. But um, we, can, we can kind of make those conclusions. All right, so what's our recipe here? All right, what's our recipe? To summarize, we have something that extends JFrame. We have a class that extends JFrame. Its main event is going to make an instance of itself. All right, so it's sort of like the application's start window or home window or whatever you want to call it. So. We have a class that extends JFrame. The main method of it is going to make an instance of itself. Its constructor is going to create what that window is going to look like. And it's going to create it by adding panels, adding components to those panels, and so on. All right, setting the size of it and ultimately making it visible. All right. 
The other thing that that constructor is going to do is it's going to assign action event listeners to the things that we want to write some code for when the user interacts with them. For example, the button click. All right. Now, a class can be an action listener if it implements the action listener interface. And in this case, it's, it's, it's the same class. It's all in one class. The class is the frame and it's also the action listener. And we added to the button the, um, the, um, we added to the button um, the action listener of this class, which means that when the button is clicked, that action perform method is going to occur. I, I think it would be fair game to like ask questions on the final like this, you know. What does this line do? You know, may, may, you know, maybe I show this code and I'll ask what does this line do? You know, what does this line do? And so on down the line. All right. Now the details of this are going to be different, right? Every, every GUI window is going to look different. It's going to have different components on it. Those components are going to be laid out differently. Um, it may have more than one action listener to it. All right. But this recipe is sort of going to hold. We're not always going to give it this, right? But again, we are going to the things that we want the user to interact with, we're going to give some action listeners for to write the code that's going to be executed. Now, in this case also, notice that the, the action uh, perform method, it does all the code itself. In reality, it probably won't, right? In reality, a real application, that's where it will create the other objects. It'll create the student object, for example. Maybe there'd be a text box for um, the student name and a, and a, a radio button for um, the kind of student they are, whether in county or out of county, right? And then maybe a list of check boxes of which classes they're taking, all right? And when you click that button, what will you do? You'll create a student object, right? And you'll initialize it with the name from the text box and the value from the radio button, all right? You'll then create class objects based on what they've picked in their check boxes and use those to create and add them to their, the schedule for that student and so on and so forth. So this code is not going to always do everything itself. In fact, it would be very poor design if it did, right? We're doing it all here because this is just the very first example. All right? In real examples, this will be creating other objects that will go and do its thing. So this will become, this class will become sort of a front end to give parameters to go and create the stuff that you did before. So you could conceivably take any of the lab assignments that we did where you hard coded how long the trip was, and how many days you're staying overnight, and what kind of car you're taking, and what kind of room. You could put a front end there that would, instead of having hard-coded your test cases, you'll supply, you'll create one of those uh, objects, and you'll supply the parameters and do the calculation and display the answer there. So this is sort of the front end for this. Again, only because this is, you know, an early example are we actually not... Um, calling another class, but what we're doing everything all in this one example. Questions about this one? Yes? What was set visible for? Set visible is, is you know, that, that's sort of the final, like, I've done configuring it, now I'm going to make it so you can see it. So that, uh, so that, it made the frame visible, right. Again, if there's no thing there, you can assume it means this. Be interesting if I do this. If I put this here, if we'll be able to see the window form or not. Good question. Let's see. No. Yeah, it didn't work too well. There's a main content panel. You can have more than one panel. All right. 
Yeah, there, there's a main content panel for it, but that itself, you could put panels inside of panels and nest them and all that. There, there's one one of those per uh, per per frame, yeah. Because nothing happened. No, I ran it. Oh, maybe I didn't. I thought I ran it. Yeah, let's see. Well, let's try again. I thought I did both. So let's go in. I'll put that there. Compile it. I guess I didn't. My mistake. I thought I thought I, I ran it as well. My, you know, my mistake. And again, we probably didn't actually see the window and then see the stuff pop on it because just because the code's so quick. Yeah. All right. Yeah, my mistake. Long day. All right. Go ahead. Should what be in a try catch? This stuff? I'm not sure what could go wrong with that, right? I mean. Anything that could go wrong with this would be caught by compile, I would think. Um, what's more, if anything were go to wrong, if anything were to go wrong with this, how would I handle it, right? Because this is my window. If I can't make a window, where am I going to display my my results? You know, uh, I guess I could. You know, uh, so so yeah, I'm not really sure what I could do that. You don't necessarily surround everything by a try catch. You know, you, you know, the idea is, is, is things that you can look at and say, I could see this going wrong because such and such. You go and do it. Um, I was going to ask the question if we should start looking at the next example or if she, we should call the night and head to lab, but I, I see we kind of already have that answer. Uh, what I will do is I will post the next, ex next example. The next example essentially adds, adds a... Um, second listener to it. So, I think it does anyhow. Yeah. Here we have a temperature. We have two buttons. Ooh. Can we do that the same way as we did the other one? All in one class. That's, that's the cliffhanger for next time. All right. Can we do it the same way? Can we put it all in one class? If not, what can we do? So we'll pick up on that one next time. All right. I do want to give a little bit of time if people have questions about their refactoring lab or anything or if you're having trouble with stuff to do that. So next couple lectures I might not go the whole time. So I guess now is a good time as any to finish. All right. See you up in lab. If you absolutely can't wait until next week I will post the code. You can take and, and dissect it and, and look at it.